Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. amen. O Lord, Lord, you are the light, you shone upon those who were in darkness, and they were illumined upon the blind, and they recovered their sight. Let your face now shine upon us, and we shall be illumined by you. Walk in the way of your gospel teachings, and glorify the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass us against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, the Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mother of the light, pray for us. Saint Mary, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. So being good meters, we're already in camp mode, right? So I don't have a camp. So this will be the last week. And then um, the idea that we'll do is we'll pick it up again in November, uh, October, the first week of October probably, and then do October and then the first two weeks of November, six weeks, and then we can kind of pause and then we'll wait for the kind of hysterical chaos that takes place that we call the holidays. And then in January, we'll start up again, and then we'll see. If we're bored, we'll just maybe go to the end of the lunch or something. Like that. But the idea for this evening is what we'd like to do is I'm hoping that we'll get us to the mid-fourth century. So that we have the period of time when St. Mary would have been born. We don't know exactly when he was born. We know he dies pretty precise, more or less precisely around 410. But um, we'll see, we'll try to build up, because it's really important to understand what's going on politically, what's going on religiously, what's going on ecclesiastically during all this time, because we've already announced to you all the explosions that are going to take place in the 400s. So none of this makes sense. So why we're spending so much time on this history, so that we understand why these people were not lunatics, you know, why did they all start trying to kill each other? I mean, literally in some places, over religious questions. It's not just that they were mad and insane in the 400s. It all builds up what goes on historically in this context. And so it's important um, for us to look at. And then, um, the idea is hopefully we get through that and then at least look a bit at the introduction to start up because, of course, once we start with the book, we're going to do more thorough history of precisely this century, the 5th century, before we actually, because then the rest of the book is on our faith. What develops out of all of this, the living of the sacraments and all of the rest of it. So, all right. Now we left off last week with the, um, how Herod becomes king at our Lord's birth. And so what we built up to that. So we've got who are the Arameans, who are these people, what is the language they speak, what, what is the expanse of where they live, basically what we call the indigenous people who have been there for millennia, how the Greeks, the Hellenic culture, gets into the area, which gave us an explanation why the Gospels themselves, if our Lord enters into the Jewish people and they speak Hebrew, they speak an Aramaic language, why the Gospels are written in Greek. So we explain why the Hellenes were there. And then, of course, we all know that Pontius Pilate is a Roman. Well, how does this Roman get into the story? And where do the Romans come from, considering they're already halfway across the Mediterranean? So we were leaving off with, then last week we did the Romans and how they wind up coming in, mentioning about Mark Anthony, the suicides, all that. And then we mentioned that Herod had been given kingship by Rome, but he, they're, they're the patron. You know, he's a client king. He may call himself king. They gave him the title of king, but he wasn't sovereign, as we would normally think a king to be. And then we mentioned how horrible this family was, and if you outlived your dad, the sons weren't much better, and in some cases they were probably worse than their father. 
And so when Archelaus, um, Archelaus is just dismissed by Rome. You, you're no longer king, you're nothing. You know, you're, not, you're just not, you're not in charge anymore. And that's when they break up the tetrarchies. And that's where we get Antipas and Philip and these sons of his, of this division of the province of these tetrarchies divided up of their father who had been king of the whole area, so-called Herod the Great. Now Herod did build the temple. I mean, he did build this magnificent esplanade that was a wonder to everyone. Everyone loved this building, but they spent, as we know from the Gospels, over 40 years building it. So Herod does give things politically to keep us popular with the people, but as we mentioned, he wanted to make sure there was wailing at his death, and he knew no one was going to cry when he died, so he wanted the prisoners that he had had imprisoned killed at his death. And that way at least the families would be wailing the wailing supper. Now of course people had more common sense. He's dead now. Nobody nobody carried out that command. He's dead. So no one did do that. But it gives you the idea of the mentality of the man. That he would want a massacre just if there's a wailing in the streets at the time of his death. Very bizarre. And then we mentioned at the time, when this whole thing is broken up into tetrarchies, Rome then makes it just simply a satellite province of Syria. All right? So Pontius Pilate is procurator. He's a local governor of this area. But the actual governor of the whole Syria is up in Antioch. No, actually it's in Caesarea. Caesarea Mar uh, Maritima. So it's the coastal... Caesarea. If you look it up online, you'll see the harbors. You can visit it still, and they're ruins, but the water and the coastline has changed. So part of the city is actually under the water at this point. It's like the discoveries that were made recently of Alexandria in Egypt. They found a lot of the ancient city of Alexandria under the sea. So actually, what Egypt is building now is a um, kind of a, a maritime, submerged, underwater uh, museum of this area. How they're going to develop, I don't know exactly. It's only in the last 10, 15 years that all this has really been coming to an organization. All right, so but when you read the Acts of the Apostles, St. Paul is being carted back and forth between Jerusalem and Caesarea. In fact, at one point, he's imprisoned in Caesarea, and they want him brought back to Jerusalem to be tried at the Sanhedrin in the presence of the Roman authorities because their idea is they're going to waylay, they're going to waylay the, the, the caravan and they're going to murder him. And they even go to the point where they say, we will not eat or drink and make a vow to God, but they won't do this until they kill this imposter, Paul. Okay? So that's why they go back and forth. So Caesarea is on the coast. Now, Someone could hand this out. This, is, this gives you the breakdown of what the provinces look like. And you'll see when we get the word diocese. This is, this is a later, Di Diocletian is the one who will break down in the 300s the area of Eastern Western Roman Empire. And the territorial regions that he breaks them into are called diocesis, diocesis. And that's the terminology they wind up using. So the church has taken that Roman terminology. So the chart that you're going to see is basically going to be at the time of Diocletian, of the breaking down when he divides the government. But I, you can see then where you have Antioch very clearly on the map, and that whole diocese of the east. This is why for most of its history, what we call Syria, actually encompasses on the political map what is now Syria, Israel, Lebanon, and Jordania. That's Syria for most of its history. Okay? That gives you an idea. Now, we go back to our history. As we mentioned that it's in the second century during first Augustus and then later on with Tiberius, it's towards the end of the first century during this Pax Romana that um, 
Antioch really becomes this architectural jewel. It's when they build more. The aqueducts, they engineer and manage because the mountain that is beside the city of Antioch, which is good for protection, also became a source of, of flash floods. The waters come rushing down the mountain, so they engineered a way to control that. And it's really at this point, precisely when Antioch becomes Christian, is at exactly the same time. So when the people go after Pentecost, and the persecutions are unleashed by the Jewish population in Jerusalem, and the people flee, the Christians flee to Antioch, they're arriving in a city which is at the very peak of its culture, its wealth, its architectural splendor. I mean, obviously things are built later on, but really the pinnacle is taking place in this, this first century. They would have been living in a city that was constantly having buildings put up. Okay? And so a lot of times when we have the fathers of the church talking about Antioch, you're talking about it precisely in the, from its first and second century period. Because it's the Syrian capital. And later on, when you look at your map again of Antioch, you'll see there's walls around it. Because during the times of the problems with the Persians, it's going to be the military base also. And the emperors will stay there in Antioch during that time. Now, back to Jerusalem. So when you read the Gospels, you have these different groups. We know from Josephus, who is a contemporary of our Lord, and who talks about John the Baptist in his history of the Jewish wars. He's, um, he's very pro-Roman, Josephus, though he's Jewish. And so he's writing about what the things that take place. He talks about John the Baptist, for example. What he also does is he's giving us a history. He talks about the Essenes, these mysterious people that we never had really much of an idea of where they were or what. They're not in the Gospels. And that's why only since the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 1940s, that in these last 70 years, to be able to link together who the Essenes were, most likely with this community that was at the Dead Sea. Now, when you read the Gospels, again, we don't talk about the Essenes, but we have people called Herodians in it. These are Jews who are clearly partisans politically of the Herod dynasty, Hashmanayim. Some of them certainly are going to be Pharisees, because the Pharisees arise at the same time as those Jewish civil wars. We also have the scribes we talk about. That's just simply your intel intelligentsia. Many of them will be Pharisees. We also refer to the Sadducees, and we call them Sadducees in English, but their actual name is from Zadok. Zadok, Z-A-D-O-K, Zadok. And Zadok is one of the great high priests, descendants of Aaron from the Old Testament. And so when you see the Sadducees, these are, these are the, this is the priestly party. These are the men who control the temple. So they control the entire central aspect of the life of Israel. Which is why it's important later on, because when the temple is destroyed, the Sadducees lose their power base. Because they don't have it, they don't have that, they don't have the temple any longer. Therefore, they don't have the same clout that they had before. And at that point, by the end of the first century, the only ones really standing are the scribes and the Pharisees. And that's why synagogue becomes the norm for how the Jews live then for the next two thousand years. So we have all of this division taking place. And I might have mentioned to you, we have St. Simon, one of the apostles. And Simon in the Gospel is called a zealot. Now, which is probably telling us something about his history. It's not zealot in the sense that he's just zealous. They're all zealous. He's zealot in the sense that this is another political faction of the Romans, excuse me, of the, of the Jews at the time. And the Zealots were basically your version of the Taliban. Uh, well, the Taliban were to Afghanistan. The Zealots were in Palestine. They fostered lots of assassinations. The Romans didn't call them the Zealots. The Romans called them the Sicarii. Sicarii is plural from Sicarius. And 
Octavius is the Roman, the Latin word for a big dagger because it was their preferred instrument of assassination. Get close, in your face, stab you dead. And it was to get rid of the Roman occupation. And even though there's a faction doing this, the same way you keep saying, why doesn't Islam get up and condemn the Taliban? Why don't they condemn ISIS? Why don't they do this? Because they don't condemn them any more than you would have condemned the knights going off in the Crusades. You just see them as being your really zealous military political branch. Maybe not so much political, but someone who's really doing something for you, the downtrodden occupied country. So you may denounce the barbarism of the assassinations, but you also have a certain sympathy to them because who wants the Romans here? All right? So, so it's very likely that St. Simon came from one of these factions of the Jews, this political movement, which is why he's known as the Zealot. And so the Sicarii. So you're getting the idea to understand you have the Essenes, the Sadducees, the Herodians, the priestly class, the Sadducees, the scribes and the Pharisees are just a faction among them. But even amongst the Pharisees, there's different schools. If you read the Acts of the Apostles, St. Paul talks about, I am a Pharisee of the school of Gamaliel. So it's the main rabbinical teacher they have. And other Pharisees would have followed other rabbinical teachers. So you have all of this division, like you have, as you would expect in any kind of human community. But of course, since there's no clear leadership at this point, because the Romans are also appointing the high priest, the high priest was supposed to be for life. Now it's being bought and sold from the time of the Maccabean Wars. So now the Romans, I mean, when you read the Gospel, you see it talks about Caiaphas and Ananias, son-in-law, father. And they pass the thing back and forth in the family as to who's the high priest. And we're told Caiaphas is high priest that year in the Gospel of St. John. <coughs> for a year, you get named for it for a year. And doubtless, like many political nominations, you get your nomination also came from the graph that came in that you basically bought the office that you could be in. So, it's an understanding of all of this division that's going on in this area and this foreign power that runs all the government, who are the Romans. And it's important to understand the humiliation that when the Sanhedrin has to go to Pontius Pilate, who they consider a Gentile pagan nothing, but they have to go and grovel to get rid of this wayward lunatic rabbi from Nazareth. The humiliation that they have to go through. And we're told in the Gospel, they won't go into the Praetorium, otherwise they'll be polluted. It's a Gentile establishment. If they go in there, they will be ritually contaminated and they won't be able to celebrate the Passover that night. And so, all of the things that come in here is this turmoil and this agitation. And that's why they have to announce that our Lord claims to be king. Because it's the only thing that's going to catch the Romans' attention. Because the spirit and the attitude amongst the people of Israel, including the apostles, which is why when we're told in the Acts of the Apostles, when our, just before our Lord's ascension into heaven, Peter asked him, is it now that you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? They keep waiting for this political manifestation, even after the resurrection. It's only at Pentecost that they are transformed interiorly. And from that point on, they no longer look to have political. But in Philippi or Thessalonica somewhere, when one of the riots inevitably surges around, um, around Paul, agitated by the Jewish population trying to get rid of him, they make the accusation against him. But they say that there, is, that there is a king, another king, called Jesus. We have that in the Acts of the Apostles. It's part of the original preaching. But of course, kingship at that point means something different. Whereas what, the, what most of the Jews are expecting are in literal interpretations of the Psalms. That he shall be king from the sea to the river. That from the Euphrates to the Mediterranean, and they give these huge territorial dimensions of what the kingdom of the Messiah and of Israel should be, which, as an aside, you do have factions amongst the Jews in Israel at this point who consider those also still to be the delineations. 
So when they occupied southern Lebanon, that faction wouldn't have seen it as being an occupation at all. Just simply a further push of their territorial borders into a, a group of pagans anyway. I mean Christians or whatever they are, Muslims, and it didn't matter to them. Some of these people really do see that politically Israel should extend to the Euphrates. So just stay tuned, that faction. So you have always these different thinkers, always in activity. And that's why when our Pilate doesn't take seriously, we have the prophecies of our Lord riding into the city on the donkey, famously on Palm Sunday. But the, and the prophecies in Zechariah are there about the Messiah coming in to bring redemption, bring the salvation. But of course, Pilate, looking at this whole scene, he's concerned about the, the, the hundreds of the thousands of people who are in this, this movement that's taking place. But he's not concerned about the man bumping along on a donkey. I mean, this guy's not riding in on a horse. This is not, he's not leading a faction of people. But you had had people claiming to be the anointed, claiming to be the Messiah before our Lord and after our Lord. And that's because the prophet Daniel had prophesied 500 years before that the anointed one will appear in the holy city in 490 years. That's why they're all in expectation of the coming of the Messiah. The prophets had told in five centuries this was going to take place. That's the agitation. So you have men before our Lord claiming to be the Christ and men after our Lord claiming to be the Christ and it's a reason why in the Gospel our Lord never uses the title of calling Himself the Christ. The only person that He tells it to is the Samaritan woman because the Samaritans don't have any political expectations of the Messiah. For them, the Anointed One is meant to be a teacher like Moses and that's what they're waiting for. So even if this woman morally is kind of a basket case working on her fifth husband, the religion that she's practicing doesn't have the political contamination or exaggeration of waiting for some political kingdom. And when you have even the demons referring to our Lord as Son of God in that, our Lord silences them. And when Peter prophesies, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, as they come down, as, they're, as they move away after that moment in Philippi in the north, our Lord tells the apostles, you're to tell no one about this. When they, Peter, James, and John, after the transfiguration, they see Moses and Elias in this stupendous glory around our Lord as they come down from the mountain. He tells them, you're to tell this to no one. Because he doesn't want the provocation of this false expectations or falsified expectations. Because what had happened is, all of the points about the glory of the Messiah throughout the prophets, they kept those. Which is what we do as human beings. And all the things like in Isaiah, about the, the Redeemer being scourged for us, for our redemption, they just ignored that and said, we don't understand that. And of course, our Lord merges it together and clarifies their minds. When He tells the disciples in Emmaus, when He gives them the understanding of the Scriptures, don't you see that it's clear that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer first and then enter into his glory? We read that and we turn the page because we're so used to the story. But no one was expecting that. That's the important thing. And maybe our fault. Because since we have the same number in the kitchen as we are. So that, what's important, because to give you what happens to Jerusalem, you absolutely must understand this turmoil. Otherwise, you just come across and say, so you get bizarre things. Like in the last 40, 50 years, you've had strange scriptural interpretations, even unfortunately from some Catholic authors, of, well, because Christ never calls himself the Christ in the Gospels, he wasn't really aware of his consciousness as being the Messiah, which of course is ludicrous. He's God. So it's important to understand why our Lord, and why he keeps using this term, Son of Man. Which in Aramaic, Baradom just means a man. He just keeps calling himself the man, the man, the man. It's like, who is this man? And you have it in the gospel. They ask, who is this son of man? They ask him these questions. He's using terminology 
which the political aspect is not what they're expecting. And it's one of the reasons why the, the Sanhedrin, the political authority in Israel, rejects him. Because they are so bent on what the Messiah is going to be as this glorification politically of Israel, they don't even hear what he's saying. Okay? Now, we have this turmoil. This is why Pilate is walking on pins and needles. Our Lord makes reference to Pilate. Apparently during some pilgrimage, some riot taking place, Pilate must have just had the soldiers come out and they wipe out and just simply massacre part of the crowd. And we know historically also that Pilate is transferred shortly after these events, a few years later. It's not because of these events, but he's already, as far as he's concerned, this was not a prime position to receive as a governor uh, in the administrative system. You're sent to the backwaters with these people who are these, think of Gaza in the last days with all of the chaos breaking out around it. It's not to say whether it's better, good or bad what they were doing, but just this constant turmoil that we ourselves witnessed. That's what's going on also at the time of Pilate. Who wants to be sent out as governor to this place? And so he's out there and the turmoil that's surging around with these men claiming to be the Christ before, claiming to be the Christ after, you constantly have these rebellions. Which is why Pilate is not in Caesarea. He's not on the coast during that Passover. He is in the city of Jerusalem. He does not live in Jerusalem. He lives in Caesarea. He is in Jerusalem in order to squelch any riots that are going to take place during this time. That's why he's there. And when he finds out that Herod's also here because of the Passover, he's not, he's not here because of religious reasons. Herod happens to come for religious reasons. That's when he sends our Lord off, and then Herod just mocks our Lord too. So the whole thing just becomes worse. Now, there are these continual rebellions that come in. And of course, you know, they've made movies and all this. I'm sure you all saw the document, the film that was made back in the 80s or something of Masada. When they finally, they find, it's one of Herod's castles that he made down around the Dead Sea. And it's the place where the Jews take their last stand during the 60s. The 60s are when everything breaks loose. Everything breaks loose. So our Lord is glorified in the early 30s. In the year 30, maybe 32, maybe 29. Around the year 30, our Lord is almost certainly is a time when he is glorified at the right hand of the Father. And for the next three decades, you have further agitation. It's important to also remember that as far as the Roman authorities are concerned, Christianity is just Judaism. It's just another one of these factions. You know, so these people are Herodians, they're Sadducees, these people are, they follow a thing they call the way. They're just another group of Jews. And it's important when it comes time for the destruction of Jerusalem. Okay. Now, this agitation builds in the 60s. And our Lord has already said three decades before, remember when they're all standing there and they're admiring this absolutely stupendous architectural wonder? That's the temple. And he says, there will not be left a stone upon a stone here. Of course, they're totally shocked. And then our Lord telescopes the destruction of Jerusalem with the end of the world. And there are theological reasons for that we'll talk about later on when we get into the book. Of course, they don't really understand this. Why? So what happens here in the 60s is this builds and builds and builds until the year 70. When the Jews are putting down these riots, it's one of the things they say, well, what happened to the Essenes? Were the Dead Sea Scrolls ferreted away in these caves during this time of these wars? We don't know. But it's also very likely that the Essenes actually converted to Christianity. It's very likely. That's a whole other question, but. But it's during those years when those scrolls are put, where they just kept there normally, as being a place of seclusion and cool and dry and, and not in sunlight? Who knows? But finally what happens in the year 70 is the Roman soldiers are told explicitly that they are not to destroy the temple because of its architectural value. 
But since the Jews will not give out, not give out, and the siege lasts so long and is so horrible, we're told by the historians that the people were reduced to eating their children. They were becoming cannibals because there was nothing left to eat in the city. There was a water source, the pool of Siloe, where our Lord sends this man to go and to have his sight given back to him. That's actually inside the walls of the city. So there was a water source, but of course eventually food is gone. And when that food is gone, we are told of the cannibalism and of the eating of their children. Now, we're also told that once the city fell, that the Romans were so furious that there were no trees left around Jerusalem for all the, crucif all the crucifixions that were taking place in order just to kill these people, to execute them. And we also know, and I think even the name of the soldier who did it, by the time they fought, and even after the walls were broken and the soldiers were in Jerusalem, they kept fighting. And the Romans were becoming so aggravated, they would not give up. And the priests themselves fought all the way to the temple, protecting itself, yeah. trying to protect the temple. That in doing that, by the time the Roman soldiers arrive, they are so furious, that's when they wind up throwing the burning embers into the temple. Because the temple had above the opening along the roof line they had no windows in the temple, but there was light and air that came in through these open spaces. And we know that that's when the temple was destroyed. And the Romans intentionally destroyed the city on purpose. When you see the pictures of the Wailing Wall, the Romans consciously left that piece of the esplanade, which are the retaining walls, what it is, it has nothing to do with the temple building. It's a retaining wall for the esplanade where the temple was above. The Romans left it there on purpose because they wanted the Jews to understand they could have destroyed everything. And they left it there as a humiliation for them, which to this day we call the Wailing Wall. But it was quite political in its choice to leave that thing there. All right? To finish just before we do our sugar break, because we built up to this point. That is not the end of the Jewish wars. The destruction of Jerusalem, or the burning of the temple, is not the end of the Jewish wars. Between the year 70, the destruction of the temple, and the year 135, for the next 65 years, these rebellions continue to go on and on and on and on. And so finally, between 132 and 135, you have what is called the Rebellion of Bar Kokhba. This is a very famous historical moment. This man, Bar Kokhba, son of Kokhba, claims to be the Messiah. Yes, Kokhba. Kokhba. But a Kochba between 132 and 135 leads an armed rebellion with thousands of men following him against Rome. And Rome, at this point, after having wars go on for about 80 years, had had enough. And not only do they massacre and get rid of these men, they destroy Jerusalem. They rebuild the city completely. So in 135, they squash the whole thing and they, they rename the whole territory Syria-Palestina. Okay? Palestine is a corruption of the word for the Phoenicians. Palestina, Palestina is the word. Palestine is coming from the Latin's use of the word naming Phoenicia, Palestine. It's related. They destroy the city of Jerusalem. They obliterate its name. It will never be known again as Yerushalayim. 
It will never be known again as Jerusalem. They rename it Aelia Capitolina. That becomes its official name, Aelia. The Muslims to this day still call it, I think, Ali or something. They have a variation of Aliya, Aliya. Because the Muslims, that's the name when they invade in 635, it's still called Aelia Capitolina 500 years later. All right? Now, not only do they destroy it, they devote it to Jupiter Capitolinus who was the god of Rome on the Capitol Hill, on the Forum. They also destroy whatever is remaining of the temple. And they build a temple to Jupiter on top of that spot. So when you watch CNN and you see the Temple of Rock and the Golden Dome, that's where the Romans built the Temple of Jupiter. And then as I mentioned to you earlier, because for the Romans, the Christians were just Jews, they destroy Calvary. They destroy the area because all these Jews were going out to this place all the time and venerating, you know, these people, dead people are here in cemeteries. These are freaky people. They're hanging out in cemeteries, you know, so they're all out of this tomb area. And so they destroy it. This is why when you see, or if you go to Jerusalem, you don't find a cave. You find a piece of something. You find part of what was Calvary. And the stone of the anointing, which should be the antechamber before the chamber where our Lord's body was laid on Good Friday, it's 50 feet away in another part of the building. Because the whole place was destroyed and they built a temple devoted, I, don't, I think, to Artemis, to Adonis or something on top of this, in this grove. And then they made it illegal for any Jew to step foot to reside in this city in perpetual. No Jew is ever allowed to come back to Jerusalem, to Aelia Capitolina, period. And that law was enforced for the next 600 years, 500 years, excuse me. In the fourth century, when Christianity was legalized, Christians were allowed to go to Jerusalem. But up until the fourth century, even Christians weren't allowed to be there legally. And the Jews were in the, didn't go back to Jerusalem until after the Muslims took over the city. Because even the Byzantine Empire didn't allow, because it's the same Roman Empire, didn't allow the Jews to reside in Jerusalem. All right? To understand this devastation that took place. So when our Lord says, not one stone will be laid upon a stone, and the destruction of Jerusalem is symbolic of the destruction of the world in the Gospel. There you go. See, we couldn't have built up to that climax after coffee. So now we'll take our break. Very nice. Oh, this is getting interesting. Yeah. I like the I like the music. Because you will find articles written. So, for example, the Protestants have a whole cage and garden outside of Jerusalem, they claim to be the cave of our Lord's resurrection. Because the, the, the basilica of the resurrection is inside Jerusalem, our Lord is crucified outside the city, and none of this looks like it's outside the city, and we don't see a garden or any of these things. And then you'll have other articles written saying, we don't really know where the tomb is. And this is absurd. Because in 135, because of the very clear veneration of the Christian population in Jerusalem at that time, they built a temple on top of it. So it's true. Helen doesn't show up until the 300s, 200 years later. But it's not like some, we have this space. People will say, well, you know, Helen doesn't go and find the wood of the cross and the nails and all these things until two centuries later. So who knows? Maybe it's not true. This is the way we do history in the modern world. But of course, it's a complete ignorance of the fact that they built, practically within the lifetime of the first disciples, monuments, which Constantine being 
the supreme pontifex maximus of the pagan colleges, he had the right to do with temples as he chose to do, and with tombs. And so when Helen shows up, being mommy to the, the emperor is pretty helpful. She has them tear down these temples. Not the one on the temple on the, on the Esplanade. They tear down the one where our Lord's tomb was. As Christians, are not so much interested about the temple. That's all done now. And it was destroyed in justice. So that wasn't an interesting, which is why the building that you see there now with the golden dome is built by the Muslims on that spot. But we'll get back to that in a moment. It, uh, it actually also seems to be an imitation and a duplication of a church that is built in Antioch, octagonal with the golden dome, centuries before him. Constantine has an octagonal church with a golden dome built in Antioch, known as the Great Church. Anyway. So we know exactly where these places were. And that's why when you go to the Basilica of Jerusalem, if you ever go to Jerusalem, go to the church at five o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning when they first open, 5 o'clock in the morning. Because after that, it's just Disneyland. I mean, it's just there's people all over the place, there's noise, there's commotions, there's ceremonies. It's really quite chaotic and very unedifying in many ways. And you have priests who live in the building because they punched apartments in from the outside. And so they punched holes through the Crusader building. And you'll see them in there. I mean, I saw priests eating oranges because they're after lunch. And so they're just walking around the church and having their postprandial walk inside the basilica. Cats walking through. I mean, you know, it's just the, very much the Middle East. All right. So as we said, the Christian population was allowed to move back into Jerusalem once Christianity was legalized in the 300s, so two centuries after this. But the Jews were still not allowed to enter the city. So that's why when the Muslims attacked Jerusalem in 636, 638, 635, whenever, the 630s, the people who are in them, when Persia invades in the 500s, these are, this city is a Christian city. There's nobody else in this city except Christians. So when they take the, the relics of the cross, when they take thousands of people into captivity, these are all Christians being led into captivity. That's the only population that's in Jerusalem, the only population at Damascus at the time, the only population in Antioch. Everyone's Christian. All right? But we're getting ahead of the story here. All right. Now... We mentioned so what they build over is Capitolina because they build this temple for Jupiter Capitolinus and over the over Calvary is the temple of Venus and Adonis. Now the thing that we want to know at the end of at this period in 135 at the end of the first century so about the year 100 the main, the three principal places of Christianity throughout the empire are Antioch, which is the original, that is the original city of God, Antioch. Because Jerusalem at that point is destroyed. So we have Antioch, Rome, and Alexandria. This is an argument for all of your Protestant friends. Now understand that even historically at the end of the, so by the year 100, 110, end of the first century, those are the three main sites, Alexandria in Egypt, Rome of course, and Antioch. And all three of these cities, churches, are Petrine. They are all either directly, or in the case of Alexandria, because of St. Mark. St. Mark is the translator for St. Peter, also known as John Mark. So the other two, Rome, is where he finishes, of course, his days. Antioch is where Peter first goes after Pentecost. So there are Christians, there are disciples already in Antioch. We're told it's where they call themselves Christians. 
But Peter goes there for about 10 years and organizes the church, then goes on to Rome. So he first leaves Jerusalem during the persecutions. By the time in the year 70, when the temple is destroyed, the city's not destroyed, but the, I mean, the city's burned. But the city hasn't been clearly re, just effaced and then renamed with a pagan name. There are almost probably no Christians in the city in the year 70, because our Lord told us these things were coming. And if you read the Acts of the Apostles, then clearly <coughs> after Pentecost, you have prophets. People who are moved by the Spirit to tell them of the coming and pending doom. And so people leave. That's why so many of them are in Antioch within the first year after Pentecost. And so probably, I don't know, three, five years after Pentecost, Peter goes to Antioch and begins to organize this church. And then after spending probably about a decade there, goes to Rome. And then, of course, famously is martyred there and finishes his days in Rome and is buried in Rome. But his interpreter, disciple, writer, St. Mark, is the one who goes and historically, the tradition is he's the one who organizes the Church of Alexandria. Which is why actually the Copts call their church the Faith of Mark. So the way we call our place Beit Marun, our church is Beit Marun, the House of Mary. They are, they are the House of Mark, the Faith of Mark what they call themselves in the Coptic church. So what's fascinating is that all three of the main churches, and this is the way it will be for the next two centuries, they are the centers of Christianity at the very beginning, and they're the main ones. And it's only in the late 300s that officially they will recognize Constantinople, and they will recognize, of course, by honor, Jerusalem. And that gives you the famous five patriarchs. Because basically, whatever was in Jerusalem, liturgy, prayers, and all that, went to Antioch. And from Antioch, it went to Constantinople. And in Constantinople, of course, it became more and more ornate because it was a court ceremony. All right, any questions? That was ideally where we were going to finish off two weeks ago, but... <laughs> now, we have one more handout. And this one gives you the breakdown of the, of the diocese, of the provinces within that larger map of diocese that I gave you. Because when we, in the fall, when we start talking about Maroon and more of the history of the 5th century, there will be references made to the fact that Maroon is from a place called Syria Chela, Chele. But here it's written out, Chele Syria. It's the northern Syria. And again, you have Antioch very clearly marked here. So it just gives you a breakdown. You can see the Nisibis right on the border there up in the top of the map. To the right. That's the eastern frontier. That's why... St. Ephraim, who we know is associated with Edessa, he only actually finishes the last 10 years of his life in Edessa. He's actually from Nisibis. And he's part of the exchange of populations that take place when Rome loses. Nisibis, for a moment, is part of control under Persia, part Rome. So when Rome finally loses control of Nisibis in 362, Part of the treaty allows the Christian population to move to the west. And that's why Ephraim, amongst all what the rest of the population, they move to the west and they move to Edessa, which is, which is on the map there. And so he's originally from Nisibis, very much in Persian territory, but he finishes his last 10 years of dying in Edessa because it was the next biggest city to go to outside of this. You also see the territory called Armenia in the north. And then, of course, Mesopotamia is what's left of the place between the Euphrates and the Tigris. Okay? And then you see the bottom of the map of Egypt, where it says Thebais. The Thebaid is going to be the big area where you will have the organization of what we know as the Fathers of the Desert, around Luxor, Karnak, 
Thebes in the south. And then you can see where Alexandria is. And notice that it's only that part of northwestern, what we call the country of Egypt. No, it's the only part of the province is actually called Egypt. Otherwise, it's Arcadia, Thebais, Augustanica. Just this area? Mm -hmm. And Arabia, because being a juncture and coming with incense, because incense was only coming out of that southern part. And the Romans used it in their temples in Rome, the incense and everything. And the trading that would come out from the Red Sea. It's why under the Romans, Arabia was known as Arabia Felix, Happy Arabia. Because of all the magnificent spices coming out of India from the sea and the incense and all the silks and that would come from the northern routes from out of China. But the things from India were coming up through Arabia. Hmm? Yeah, and Petra was the big when they had control there. All right. Now, that brings us into the second century now. So during these 100s, this is when the period that Antioch comes into her full glory, second half especially, of the, um, the late second century. Oh, I meant to mention that while we have this Bar Kokhba thing going on, um, it's important to understand this is when Ignatius of Antioch dies. It's under Emperor Trajan. All right? So Trajan is emperor from the year 98 until the year 117. And Trajan is the, the emperor under whom the empire reaches its largest geographical expanse. And we talk about Hadrian's wall, but Hadrian succeeds Trajan. And he doesn't want to move any further into the painted people, which is what Picts mean. We call them Picts, the people of Scotland, but Picts is not what they call themselves. Picts is the, the Latin term for them, Picti, which means the painted people. From their tattooing they put all over their bodies. And woad. Hmm? And woad. And what? Woad, W-O-A-D. Well, yeah, yeah, but they're saying that's, so they just called them. So Hadrian just said enough, we're not going there. The first thing that Hadrian does when he becomes emperor following Trajan is he understands this expansion in the Mesopotamia and the rest of this. This is just futile. We've been doing this for, for generations. This is futile. So he immediately makes a peace treaty with the emperor of Persia and he pulls back the forces under Hadrian. So under Trajan, it reaches the largest expanse. But in the year 114, 115, I mentioned to you, this is the problem of Antioch and is ultimately going to be her destruction, is she's always having earthquakes. There are always earthquakes in Antioch. And so in 114, 115, there was a very severe earthquake. And we know a lot about the death of Ignatius from documents and letters from contemporaries at the time. But as Nero did back in the 60s, 60 years, 50, 60 years before this, they blame it on the Christians. But if this great, beautiful city is, has come to destruction like this, it's because the gods are angry. And of course, remember, what we know as Judaism today, as I mentioned to you before, is very specifically rabbinical Judaism. Pharisaical, rabbinical Judaism. We may talk about Orthodox, Reform, and all this, but they're all fundamentally synagogal, scholarly forms of the rabbis. And so they are the strain that we see in the Gospel of being the Pharisees down. And they really codify themselves in the first two centuries just as much as Christianity does. So both the modern day, as we understand, Pharisaical rabbinical Judaism and Christianity both come from the Christ, but for totally different reasons, codified. So for example, the temple is destroyed in the year 70, as we said. This is devastating. And it's clear the Romans aren't going to let us build anything. So they meet in a coastal city in Palestine called Yamnia. 
And in Yamnia, they have a council. The Pharisees have a council because we have to codify things now. We can't just simply have this large. Well, of course, they're the rabbis, and they know as scholars that my opinion is Professor so-and-so is better than Professor so-and-so because I'm at Harvard, and he's only at Penn State. And so these arguments always went on of who had the proper interpretation. So what, the, what they do within that first 20 years is the rabbis grab the bull by the horns. And while the priests are all standing there going, uh, there's no more ceremonies, uh, and while they're kind of saying that the rabbis start codifying and organizing, which is why in the year 90, it's the Pharisees who decide, the rabbis who decide now what is the actual list, listing of inspired books. And this famous distinction between the Catholic Bible and the Protestant Bible, and people always say because the Catholics put more books in, they didn't. What takes place in the year 90 is the rabbis define which are the scriptural texts. So if a text was not known to be written in Hebrew, not inspired. That gets rid of Maccabees. The books of Maccabees are gone. The book of wisdom is gone. Ecclesiasticus. So these books all start disappearing because they're either written, the book of Tobias is written in Aramaic, it's not Hebrew. And these other books are written in Greek, so they're not inspired. But they had considered them inspired for the last three centuries. But I mean, that was the importance we talked about, the Septuagint. Which is why 60 years after our Lord's glory, after the Messiah's glorification, the church doesn't really care what the rabbis are doing in southern Palestine. And that's why they just ignored them. And to this day, the Catholic Church has exactly the same books that were considered inspired, the Old Testament, of course, considered inspired at the time of our Lord. They just continued with that tradition as being part of it. And in fact, they never felt required to give a listing, because that listing doesn't happen until St. Athanasius in the fourth century. Because you just have the books. You read the books. They're there. But it's the rabbis who come in and who decide, nope, that's out. Nope, 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 nope. And that's where your famous seven books and parts of books all disappear. 20 years. Um, 40 years after, 50, 60 years after our Lord's glorification. It's an important point because we forget that the Protestant, the Protestant movement in the 16th century is a Judaizing movement, very much emphasizing Old Testament. The rise of nation states and kings by the grace of God, they're basing themselves very much on David as being the leader of the religious people of Israel. That's not a Catholic vision originally, yes. How come, and I watch a lot of the History Channel, how come oftentimes they say like the Marian Gospels and they mention different books that we supposedly have pulled out of the Bible? No, there's Gnostic, there's Gnostic writings all over the place. You have all kinds of heterodox Christian writings. Were they in the Bible originally? No. So they never, because no. they allude that they were. No. no. <laughs> they went around certain Christian groups, if you are, people who claim to be Christian. <clears throat> But they were never expected as being inspired. So they'd be given names. I mean, the most famous probably is the Gospel of Thomas, which is hooked into the Egyptian church and Gnosticism and that. And it's not a gospel like we know. It's not a story. It's more a series of aphorisms and little lessons that are supposed to be from our Lord. But they're encapsulizing heterodox doctrine. So sometimes, we, you know, when they found the... Um, the Gnostic Gospels of Nat Hammadi in Egypt in the early 20th century. This was a huge find because there were a lot of texts that we only knew about them because the fathers writing about them condemning them. And then we actually found these books what, later on. So it's an interesting, it's like finding the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's a complete book of Isaiah. It's the oldest copy of Isaiah in the world because it predates our Lord. And that's for various reasons why we don't have, there's reasons why we don't have ancient Hebrew text. Now, so that's why the church has continued on with it. She continued on with her book. And this is the idea also of tradition, of what it is. This is the faith we receive. These are our inspired books. Why are you going to argue about it? And that's why we have to understand the revolution of the last half century of the 20th century, when we decided that we knew better about everything from economics, politics, family tradition, religion, everything, and we just reworked the whole baby over 
So that if Situ came back from the 1920s, she'd be like, uh, you're doing what? If who came back? Situ, the matriarch. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a sit-to, it's a grandmother. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, means, it, means matri so it means the matriarch. So if they came back, you know, they would they'd kind of scratch their heads and go, you're doing what, honey? I mean, I love you to death, but what are you doing? So that's why the church just functioned that way. She wasn't getting But the Jews at the time needed to codify and give very systematically at the time. And that's why that all takes place in the year 90. Okay? Um, I think that pretty much covers us for the first century. The second. So what happens is because in the year 114, 115, this agitation blaming the Christians in the year 117, which happens also to be the last year of Trajan, that's when the pagans are upset about the earthquake in Antioch. And of course, <coughs> the Jews who are fighting with the Christians will take advantage of it and stir the pot some more. So you can read, you can find the document, you can text, you can Google it and find the death of Polycarp in Smyrna, you can find the death of Ignatius and the things that are recorded about them and how this man in his 80s was dragged off into the, 84 I think he was, dragged off into the city <coughs> and condemned and then while they, while they massacred and martyred a lot of Christians in Antioch, they took the bishop for prime choice to send him back to the games in Rome. So he died in Rome under the lions. Okay. So he's known as Ignatius the God-bearer. Right? And he is one of the greatest and the first patriarchs. They weren't using the term patriarch. He was the bishop of Antioch at the time. And we have letters of Ignatius, because as he's being trucked along in chains, he writes to the different churches in Anatolia. And he writes to Rome too. And he asks for the Christians who have clout politically, because we know even in the Acts of the Apostles, we know in the Gospels, our, in the Gospels, our Lord is being followed around from a lady whose husband is one of the ministers with Herod. So, you know, they have connections, and they had from the very beginning. He writes to the Romans saying, please do not try to get this condemnation overturned. Because it is only now that I begin to see myself as truly being a disciple. Because I will die with him so that I may rise with him. And then you have all of these Eucharistic images of how he dies and everything. It's really quite beautiful. But that's how Ignatius dies. And that's why for, I believe, the Melchites, the Patriarch of Antioch always takes the name Ignatius in it the way that the Maronites take Butros or Peter. For the same reasons. All right. Now, Antioch, I mean, we talked about all the fighting that went on in Jerusalem. Antioch, like any major city, had its own civic agitation going on quite often. If they didn't, you know, they thought being the great city that they were, that they deserved certain perks. And when they didn't get them, they'd be quite upset. You'd have rioting in the streets. You'd have all these problems around. And so in the late second century, the city is glorious. It's very wealthy. All these things going on. But what happens in the East is sports are very, very important with the Romans. And so what happens is the sports, they don't become religions. We have to become dumb enough in the 20th century to make sports a religion, which is what we do now. But they were political, and they were politicized. So famously, you'd have riots breaking out in Constantinople later on in the later centuries by over which teams of charioteers in the hippodrome. You had blues and whites and reds, and there were four main teams. And then these teams became then stratified according to the social strata of the population. So if you were among the wealthy administrators, you supported that team. And if you were, you know, the kind of penniless people in the streets, you supported that team. And eventually the two teams merge. The four teams ultimately become two political bodies. And whenever someone wins or doesn't win in the Hippodrome, then it becomes a riot quite easily. And this is what without even waiting for Constantinople, because Constantinople isn't even, a, isn't even a thought yet at this point. Antioch is already doing this in the 100s. Antioch has its games. It had the Olympic Games. 
It was one of its privileges. So every four years it had the Olympic Games. Coming out of Olympia, centuries and centuries and centuries, they're now being done. They had their own Olympic Games in Antioch. Big thing, lots of crowds come, you get to sell stuff, brings money. And when you get guaranteed to have that every four years, that's a big thing. Then in the midst of all the sports, horse racing and all the other games that the Romans had, you have the teams. And the teams become political factions. And so you have everything that entails. Fixing matches, briberies, graft, betting. <laughs> someone loses, you claim someone's done something, and it becomes riots in the street. They riot in the streets over these games. Think about the 1980s. That was my greeting of moving when I moved to Europe to continue my studies in 85. <clears throat> that was the same year when you had, I don't know, Manchester United or what it was, and you had the rioting and the breaking down of the fence, and I don't know, there were like 14 people that were killed that day over a soccer game. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's not the only one. It was the most shocking because it was in the 80s. No, nobody was doing that before. And then they started talking about hooliganism and all the rest. Human nature does this, all right? So this was already happening in Antioch. And Antioch paid for it because Rome was getting tired of it. So what happens is when you look on your map and you have Syria, Chile, C-O-E-L-E, -E, and then you have Phoenicia written underneath it, they're both Syria. You have Syria, Chile, and you have or Koile in the classical pronunciation, and then you have Syria, Phoenicia, Phoenicia. But they're both Syria. They subdivide the territory to make it more governable because the one Syria is like always being cast in the flames. That was done in the year 194. They divide the territory to make it more easily. So Syria, Phoenicia in the south would have included Palestine at one point. And Palestine, as I mentioned to you, Palestina, Phoenicia, these are the same, these are the same origins of their cognates, as far as words go. And in 194, what also Rome does is she deprives Antioch of its title of metropolis. You are not the mother city of, of Syria. And again, that's a huge political thing, because you've been demoted as a city. And you will no longer have the Olympic Games. And they're translated to Issus in the north. So back when we were talking about Alexander, we mentioned the great battle of Issus. It's further north. And the games went to Issus. So you're not going to get the games. We're going to divide your territory. Your governor will not have as much clout. And you are not a metropolis. It's pretty severe because of this constant rioting and going on around their games. They don't regain the title of Metropolis until the year 212. So almost exactly 100 years after Ignatius' martyrdom. And at that point, Caracalla. So when you see pictures of Rome and they have the baths of Caracalla, and these masses, this enormous, enormous building. Even in the ruins, it is so big, they still put on concerts. You go see Italian tenors singing there in the, in the Roman evenings. It's glorious. So you go there. But a lot of people, a lot of Christian died building Caracalla because they were condemned to slavery because of their religion. And then basically just worked to death because you were already condemned to death. But we wanted to get work out of you. All right. So Caracalla. C-A-R-A-C-A-L-L-A. C-A-R-A-C-A-L-L-A. Caracalla. Caracalla was planning a Persian campaign in 212. He doesn't know that the 200s are going to be devastating for Rome, and it's going to spend most of its time in civil war. But at this point, there's still a unified empire, and Caracalla is going to try to push and defend the eastern border once again. So he needs popular support. And the military base for campaigning is going to be Antioch. So he gives them their name of Petropolis back. He starts giving them their honors back in 212. It doesn't succeed in anything, but that's the reason why they give back a bit of their glory. Now, if you look on your maps, you will see something called the Sassanid. 
society. The Sassanid Empire is another Persian Empire, but it's taking over from what we were calling the Parthians. And the Sassanid Empire comes in in the year 230. You have a coup, there's a military shift, and now you have the emperors are now known as Sassanid and not Parthians in 230. Do you not find it? Oh. Which map is it on? Which map? Yeah. Yeah. So maybe on the first map that we have it out. Yeah, so if you look at the, the, the kind of pink one okay. that has the big diocese, okay. you'll see very far off into the east, you have Armenia in the north there. Okay. Now, not where Armenia is, it's going to come up a little bit. And then you see Dominion of the Sassanids. Now this is going to be a horrible century for the Romans because eventually the Sassanids are actually going to not only beat one of the emperors, but take him captive. So in the year 230 is the rising of the Sassanid Empire. So Antioch is still really important. And what's a, of course what else is important is this is growing. Christianity is continually growing. We're going to come back to this in a little bit. But what now Antioch has a problem of is not only the political divisions because of the sports, it also has political divisions where some of these Antiochians say, why are we supporting Rome? I mean, the Sassanians are just over, basically over the river. Why? Are, why? We have more in common with these people than we do with the middle of the, middle of the Mediterranean. So within Antioch, you have seditious movements who are actually going, well, we really should go with the Persians anyway, rather than Rome. So 25 years or so later, in the year 253, Shapur, Shapur the first, is the Shah An Shah, the King of Kings, Shah An Shah, Shapur. He, in 253, he invades Syria. And he sets fire to Antioch in 253. Not good news. And part of it is when he arrives, he has Antiochians with him in his cortege. Because we're coming home. Well, they can't quite take the city. So they set it on fire and they round up a bunch of prisoners and they bring them back to the Sassanid, the Persian Empire, with them. In 253. The 250s are continually going to be instability. And instability internal to the empire also, many civil wars. In the year 260, 70 years later, there's a second invasion of Syria comes back. And here when you come up with the pathetic character, I mean, not that he's personally pathetic, but what happens to him historically is horrible. You have the Emperor Valerian. Right? And Valerian is emperor from 253 until 260. Bad time had to take over the power. Because remember, 253 is the first year the Sassanids come. And in 260 is the next time they come back. And at that point, Valerian is in Antioch. If you understand what's happening, the emperors have to keep going to Antioch to fight against the Persians. You easily understand why 60 years later, 70 years later, Constantine just brings Rome over and puts it closer than what he builds Constantinople. They're always traveling out to the east anyway, so let's just move the whole capital over to the east. <laughs> because for about a hundred years, we have to keep going out to Antioch. And what Valerian does is he rebuilds Antioch after it's burning in 253. But what he does new is he fortifies the island in the Orontes. So you have that one map of Antioch. And you have the island in the Orontes. Now it's not just simply inhabited. 
he fortifies it. He puts a wall around it so that if everything else falls in Antioch, you can still be in the middle of the river. You have a fortifications around you on the island. And of course, you've got the river securing you for like a big moat. That's what Valerian does. But it doesn't succeed. And Valerian is taken captive. And Valerian is taken captive, and he is taken back to the Sasanid Empire. And this is horrible. Because there could not be anything more glorious for the Persian emperor than to finally take captive one of the Roman emperors. And they keep him captive. And the stories that are told, you have in Iran one of the most famous wall, and I forget exactly where it's at now, one of the most famous carvings on the side of this cliff. And you have the image, it's all written out, and you have the image of the Sasanid emperor with Valerian kneeling in front of him. It's a horrible, and it was meant to be a big PR campaign. Come to Persia and see that we are the empire. But what was also happening at the same time is when they were deporting these people in Antioch, a huge part of the population were Christian. When they carted off to the Sasanid Empire, he was being very generous and open and kind to the Christians because they were persecuted by his enemy. So on the famous principle that the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and also I want you not to be upset because I made you live someplace else, you can build all the churches and monasteries you want. Where under Datius, which was in the 250s, they were being massacred across the empire. Okay? So a good political move. And in the end, what it is said that happened to Valerian, he dies in captivity. And it is said that the Sasanid Empire had his, ba his body taxidermied, and he was stuffed. And the body stood as a trophy in the courts of the Sasanid Emperor. This is the great realm. And while he was alive, he apparently was being used on occasion as a footstool. He was made to kneel in front of the emperor who would put his feet on his back. Pretty horrible. But it's a good indication of what's happening to Rome. All right. But remember, Christianity is growing in Persia now because they keep dumping all of these Christians further east into Mesopotamia. Now, because this is not going very well for the Romans, if you look on your, I think on one of your maps, you have Palmyra, right? But you know about Palmyra because ISIS blew up one of its main architectural, two of its main architectural wonders there. Palmyra is out in the desert. Today, if you go from Damascus, it's a three-hour drive. Okay? And it was on the trade routes. It was an oasis. And the trade routes would come down through the desert, and it was a very, very sophisticated Arab. These were Arab, Aramaic peoples that controlled this. And when you look up the Palmyrian script, it's an Aramaic script. It's one of the forms of Aramaic. Now, there is a man who is the leader of Palmyra. Of course, Palmyra is what the Greeks called it. I want to say Tandor, but I don't think that's exactly the name, because it reminds me of Indian food, and I'm sure I'm mistaken, because I'm hungry. <laughs> but it's a name like that, in their language referring to the palm trees of the oasis. The Greeks call it Palmyra the same way the Greeks call Orhoi a desert. The Greeks just give all these names and because we're European, we pick up what the Greeks call them. So, Palmyra, this man's name is Anaif. Odena. 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 And Odena has control over an army on the eastern frontier. He is near the Euphrates. If you remember in World War I, they found the famous remains of the mm -hmm. citadel on the Euphrates called Dura Europus. Mm -hmm. 
one of the most famous architectural discoveries ever. It was in World War I. British soldiers were hiding behind this sand and these ruins and then discovered there's more here than just a bunch of bricks. And they found this whole Roman settlement on the Euphrates known as Dura Europos. But what's famous about it is there is a building in it which seems to be simultaneously church and synagogue. The paintings have all been taken to Damascus, but they're up the wall, but very famous. So Odinath, he's the prince of Palmyra, and what he has is he has an army which has combined Palmyrians and Romans. Now, while everything is falling apart between the year 260 and 272, Odinah said, well, this is, my, this is my moment. We have trade routes. We have an oasis. We have wealth. We're connected with Antioch. Psh, I don't need to be doing the call of some guy who's in the middle of the Mediterranean who's just gone off and be cut off by the Sassanid emperor anyway. So what he does with this army is basically he declares himself autonomous. Palmyra is not going to answer to Rome anymore. So he's making a, he's making a claim, not of independence yet, but of an autonomy. And this is a story for the ladies, because this is one of the most famous episodes in history, because of the lady. So what happens is he's assassinated in 266. Doesn't make it very far. He's assassinated. Okay. But, but, this is like Gao Xi, the last, the emperor, da, the empress dowager at the end of the Chinese empire at the beginning of the 20th century. She just makes herself empress. Doesn't last very long. 1911, the whole thing collapses. But here's the same thing. Oh, oh Dainan, he's assassinated in 266, but, his wife, the very famous Zenobia. She takes charge. Mm -hmm. And not only does she take charge of the army, she can inspire this army. This is like an Isabel. This is a woman who gets a charge there. And she not only takes charge of this army and continues with the autonomy of her husband, like many wives, they just consider her husband, he didn't go far enough anyway. The guy should have declared independence like I am right now. And she basically controls Antioch and she closed the, all of eastern Syria. She controls. And she declares a Palmyrian empire controlling Antioch. And she is now going to be the eastern empire of what had been Rome. But, she'll concede, but she will claim to be the eastern empire. Now this is interesting because it's going to echo eventually with Constantine bringing new Rome over and eventually having only the eastern Roman Empire survive while the western empire in, the, in Europe collapses. So we'll finish with her story because it doesn't take very long anyway. This is this kind of moment of stupendous glory for these Arab peoples on the eastern part of the empire. She declares her, she maintains control in the east, and then she declares independence. When her son becomes, so when the Emperor Aurelian, in 270, I think it's only 275. Yep, five years, he makes it five years. They're always being killed. In the 260s, we probably have the first Christian emperor. He's known as Philip the Arab. He was probably a Christian. He's from Bosra in southern Syria. And he was almost certainly a Christian. Philip, his name is Philip. And he was very likely a Christian. He was emperor for also five years. And I think Aurelian is the one who killed, I think, in the 60s. But Aurelian, when Aurelian becomes emperor in the 270s, at that point, in 270, she proclaims independence. Wahbalat. That's junior, baby boy. So when Wahbalat 
At that point, when mom declares we're going to be an independent empire and control this glorious trading route and Antioch, and therefore also the Mediterranean coast, Wahabalab assumes the title of Augustus in 271. Now, this doesn't, this isn't, a, this isn't as bizarre as it may sound at first. You're thinking, why would you do this? Because that's what's happening all the time. Remember the term imperator, emperor. Imperator just means general. One general, get, your, your, your generalissimo is exterminated, so your troops declare you're the new generalissimo, you're the new imperator. So here he has his crowds care out. This is great. The Romans who are there are perfectly happy for this. He assumes the title of Augustus in 271, and Aurelian is not pleased. And he marches on Palmyra in 272, and he devastates the city. To this day, you can see in the ruins, he devastates the palace, which was unusual for the Romans to do, because they would usually keep a big complex of buildings like that and use it for their own administration. <clears throat> but to finish for the grand finale on this story, Zenobia fights and fights. I mean, she's got Junior there, and he may be the Augustus, but she's the person in charge. And she fights and she fights, and Aurelian takes her captive and famously marches her back, takes her back to Rome to show her off publicly in chains, but it is said in chains that were golden. So there is a respect for her, but she brought the destruction of her city for all intents and purposes because of the audacity of trying to come out as an independent state at the time. So she's driven from Antioch. Palmyra is devastated. She's taken to Rome. She dies in Rome as a prisoner in her chains of gold. All right, we didn't quite make it. We got one more century to go, but... <laughs> <laughs> so when we come back, yes, because what we're going to come back to is when we come back in October. But in fact, the book, the introduction, if you read it, it talks about St. Marin and that. We can't do St. Marin unless we do this history. Otherwise, we don't have any idea. So what we're going to do when we come back, we're going to start with not the end of the 4th century, but the beginning of the 4th century with the persecutions of Diocletian who Diocletian is and what he winds up doing. Everybody knows the name, but what he winds up doing, okay? And then I have copies of this also. It's an essay, thank you, on the origins of the Maronites. Some of you to read over the summertime if you feel like it. And the ideas of who is St. John Mary? Is he a person? Is he not a person? Is it a realist? And so you have these questions that come up. All right, any questions before we finish? Okay, we'll finish with our prayers. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, who are before all ages, and exist from age to age, you are resplendent in your eyes, and in search of light. Through your word, you bring forth light and give us each day. A full radiant day and the source of all light. We glorify you, adore you, and offer you praise night and day. Accept our praise and answer our prayer. Send us your abundant blessings through the mercy of your Messiah. To him we give you and the Holy Spirit. Be glory, honor, power, and thanksgiving, now and forever. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, now and ever shall be, the world without end. Amen. For Mary conceived without sin, pray for us, and have recourse to you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. The last handout, which you can take with you, We'll give you a relationship between these different people that we've talked about. Ignatius is in the middle of the chart. So something else we will look at and kind of cover will be done in the beginning. So wonderful to see you.
Have a good summer and enjoy camp recording. Mm -hmm. Thank you.